FHA delinquencies continue to rise. Who would have guessed that? Welcome to Housing Bubble 2.0 News of the Week, or as you like to call it, another episode of As the Housing Market Turns. Today is the 28th of December. Hope everyone's having a great holiday season, relaxing, spending time with family, doing what you can under the current we'll call it um, pandemic conditions, et cetera, et cetera. So I thought I'd tee this up uh, today as a Monday. Um, I pulled a lot of statistics and did a lot of work over the past few days, kind of data mining some stuff, found a lot of interesting things. So yes, um, FHA stats were released for November, so we'll talk about this today. Uh, Randy Patrick here, your host, putting the realism back in real estate. All right, so yeah, we're going to focus on the FHA stuff today. I do find that interesting, but first of all, if you're not already a subscriber to my channel, if you would do me a wonderful holiday favor and smash that subscribe button and help my channel grow, I'd really appreciate that. So thank you very much. All right, guys, let's get into it now. So basically, every month um, FHA puts out, uh, I guess you could say, their housing data for FHA statistics, and there's always you know the information on delinquencies. So we know that this segment of mortgages is the highest delinquency segment that's out there. So um, there's a group called the American Enterprise Institute. They like to summarize the data and present it, which I find very helpful. So just so you can see that, here we are in November. The percent of active FHA loans that are delinquent are 17.5%. And those that are, and that could be 30 days or greater. So once you're 31 days behind the payment, you are technically delinquent. And uh, seriously delinquent typically is 90 days and greater. So you can see that 17.5% of FHA loans are currently delinquent. 11.8% uh, are seriously delinquent. And that's just a small increase from October on both ends, from 173 to 17.5%, and from 116 to 11.8%. So basically what's happening is we're seeing slight increase in new delinquencies coming through for FHA, and then those that are in, um, that are in the chute um, are, you know, as they move farther down the path, um, you know, as each month goes on, we're seeing a slight increase in delinquencies as well, too. But I guess you could say because the delinquencies are, are you know, the serious delinquencies are just sort of inching up a lot of them, a lot of the seriously delinquent are already seriously delinquent. And I guess we're not seeing too many cross that threshold, but still, you never know what's going to happen in the near future. But the whole point, though, is that this is a large segment of a pretty significant loan segment, and it's distributed all over the U.S. in different ways, which we'll go into. So those of you may wonder, well, what's so cool about FHA? Now, I talk about this quite often. And really, I just thought I'd pull this sort of slide up here. So FHA loan guidelines for borrowers. So basically, FHA is called the Federal Housing Administration, and it provides mortgage insurance on loans made by FHA-approved lenders. FHA insures these loans on single-family and multifamily homes in the United States and its territories, et cetera. All right. Um, but the whole point is that it's, it's typically lower standards to get in. So FHA loan requirements are allowing you a credit score of at least 580. And if you have a credit score of at least 580, you're going, you'll be able to put down a 3.5% down payment. So that's, to me, that's fairly, um, that's, that's low. I mean, you know, you're putting down, you know, th that's your down payment, 3.5%, as opposed to 10% or 20% for, for a conventional loan. Obviously, if your FICO score is below that 500 to, 7, not, to 579, you're, putting, you're required to put 10% down. Um, either way, you're going to have mortgage insurance uh, on on your your loan because that's an additional, I guess you could say, um, coverage in case you default on your loan. Uh, debt to income ratio has to be below 43%. The home must be in the borrower's primary residence and uh, borrower must have steady uh, in income and proof of employment. So basically, this is a full documented loan. However, my point to all this is that 3.5% is, to me, a very low risk to put money down. Now, I want to be clear here because I've seen some comments pr previously when I talk about FHA loans. I'm not knocking FHA loans. I'm not knocking the people who need need them or get them. I mean, if it works for you, work for I mean, if it's out there, if, if programs are out there, go get them. I mean, I'm not saying you shouldn't. Uh, I'm just saying that, you know, this. there's always, you know, there's people who will maximize it and use it because it's available. And there are those that probably shouldn't use it or maybe get through just by, you know, the squeak by and then and there's potential problems down the road. So where there's great reward helping first time home buyers or those with lower credit scores or don't have the funds for down payment, there's also the risk side where you know it, it can work on both ends. So that's just the nature of the business with everything that you do in real estate. But the whole point is you know, that we always focus on the fact that there's low down payments. So in the end, 
you know, if, you, if you're purchasing a property um, and you're putting three and a half percent down, are you, you know, what's your skin in the game? Everyone refers to skin in the game as risk level. Uh, if there's a slight change in the in value in the market, so you buy a property only three and a half percent down, my my concern is, hey, if the market dips five or six points, you're underwater in your mortgage, and now you're house poor. So just the way it, it plays out here. And also some of the, the guidelines here is that, you know, uh, easier to qualify. And again, this is not me. This is what's written out there about FHA loans. FHA provides mortgage programs with low requirements, makes it easier for borrowers to qualify, even those with questionable credit history and low credit scores. It does give you good interest rates, which is kind of nice. Um, um, you know, it, it, this is a great benefit when compared to the negative features of subprime mortgages, even though that FHA is kind of referred to, uh, as, it's almost like today's subprime mortgage. Having a bankruptcy or foreclosure in the past few years doesn't mean you can't qualify for an FHA loan. Uh, you know, again, you know, establishing good credit as a solid payment history can help satisfy requirements. And there are many ways a lender can determine your credit history. It includes more than just looking at your credit card activity. It's type of payment, such as utility bills, rent, student loans, etc., can show a pattern of reliability. So the whole point is that it's lower credit standards, it's lower uh, qualifications to get in, and it's a lower down payment. So that, you know, again, it works for some people. Some people may not work for it. All right, so this is where the FHA analysis comes into play. So um, basically, this American Enterprise Institute puts together a 10 most threatened metros based on FHA delinquency rates. They do it every month, and this is um, the rates through, the looks like November 30th of this year, so end of November, uh, and we'll take a look at that. First of all, if you want a copy of this spreadsheet, because there's this spreadsheet, and it also has a... Um, uh, the 169 other metros it analyzes, send me an email, I'll send you the, the spreadsheet, save you looking for it. Uh, anyway, so, um, the, and this is interesting because these top 10, which is the greater Atlanta area, the greater Houston area, the greater Chicago area, the greater Washington, D.C. area, uh, Dallas, Plano, Irving, Texas, all right, area, Riverside, San Bernardino area, uh, San Antonio area, Orlando, Kissimmee, Sanford area, Tampa, St. Petersburg, Clearwater area. So this is kind of like a metropolitan, you know, MSAs, metro areas. Uh, these really haven't changed since they started producing this. I, I remember I seen this in like, you know, and you know, maybe August or September, and I went okay. And every month, the, these top ten have remained in the top ten. I think they even haven't even changed positions. And we just see that, you know, every month that the more, you know, the percentages go up on total delinquencies, serious delinquencies. Uh, shares the whole bit. So again, what they're, you know, to, for them to determine what total, like the most threatened metros, they're taking a look at total delinquency values, serious delinquent values, and also FHA share of metro lending uh, value as well too. So I think that means that, you know, how many, how many originated loans in 2019 are, are delinquent, et cetera. So, the whole, so there's a slight calculation that they're using the methodology, says the reporting methodology there, and they determine the top 10, which they call the most threatened area. So again, and a lot of these, I'll be very upfront, are the same kind of areas that had some issues in the last housing crisis. So when I look at Tampa, Orlando, Baltimore, Riverside, uh, the Washington area, Chicago, Atlanta, you know, those areas were, were right up there with the top areas for the last housing crisis. Um, Texas didn't have as much issue. So when you have Houston, Dallas, and, and San Antonio, um, you know, Texas wasn't hurt as much in the last housing crisis. They didn't have the big dips, uh, the big correction. So um, not that there wasn't any any carnage there, but it wasn't as bad as before. But the point is, you know, there you go. We're, we're seeing kind of the same players, you know, time and time again. This is the top 10 metro. Now, if you go to other parts of the spreadsheet, what they do is they actually break it down a little bit here. So they So this is just your percentage of delinquent loans. So uh, I just did a sort on this, and this is just sort of like a, a, a larger screenshot, just with the column that makes sense. So the percent of delinquent loans in the you know service area or the MSA, you can take a look at Nassau County, Suffolk County, New York. So Long Island has almost 26% of FHA loans are delinquent. Obviously, New York, New Jersey, White Plains, then Newark, then Poughkeepsie area. So the top four areas for delinquent loans are right in that New York corridor, right? The New York, New Jersey corridor. Next, we see Lauderdale area. So Lauderdale, Pompano, Sunrise, Florida. That's Broward County. We go then to New Orleans, Lafayette area, Louisiana. Then Bridgeport, you know, Stanford, Norwalk, Connecticut. Then we get Houston in there. Then there's McAllen, uh, Texas. Then back to Chicago, back to Washington. So Miami Beach, Kendall, Florida, 
Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So we can see there's like seems to be, you know, I guess you could say uh, congregation in certain locations in certain states of, of these issues. Camden, New Jersey, the Atlanta area, West Palm, Boca, Boynton Beach, uh, Shreveport, Louisiana area, Gary, Indiana, Corpus Christi, Texas, Beaumont, Port Arthur, Texas, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, New Haven, Connecticut, Baltimore area, Boston area, Las Vegas area, Orlando, Kissimmee area. So look, all these seriously, all these delinquents are just, you know, we're talking 19% and above. So that's your top level of, of, seri of delinquent loans, which is, you know, when you look at that, that's quite a significant amount of, of, the, of the FHA loan base in those locations that are delinquent. Rounding this out, you know, you can take a look, you know, obviously Maryland area, Mobile, Alabama, you know, Charleston, you know, San Rafael, California, Naples, Marco Island, San Antonio's up there, Wilmington, El Paso, Columbia, South Carolina, um, Birmingham, Alabama, Dallas Plano, Savannah, Georgia, Worcester, Massachusetts, Lakeland, Winter Haven, just east of me here, uh, Greeley, Colorado, Springfield, Massachusetts, again, Fort Worth, Arlington, Grapevine. So again, we're looking at some of the you know, the, the big metros, that's the other side of Dallas there, Fort Worth. So, I mean, it kind of all, it's all kind of coming together, right? Elgin, Illinois, Cambridge, Farmingham, Massachusetts, Oakland, area in California, and Hartford, East Hartford, Middletown, Connecticut. So, you know, that's your, that these, this is just total delinquency. So this is just the total delinquencies and how they're gaining every month. And if we go to the next slide, which I broke it down by seriously delinquent loans. So obviously total delinquencies are the total the seriously delinquent are, are 90 days and greater, and obviously those percentage points are going to be a bit less. But take a look, though. Nassau County, Suffolk County, so Long Island is at 20% seriously delinquent. So that's pretty significant. And then the other, it's almost like the, it's almost like we've got the same, the same structure here. You know, the, the New York, Newark, Poughkeepsie, Lauderdale, then, you know, the New Orleans, Lafayette, you know, Connecticut area, Houston, another part of Texas, Chicago, Washington, Miami Beach area, Baton Rouge. Camden, New Jersey, Atlanta, West Palm, Shreveport. So this pretty much follows the um, pretty much follows you know what's ahead of us. The, the previous slides on on total delinquent, seriously delinquent, pretty much follows um, what's going on here. So this is basically from twenty to twelve and a half percent in this slide. The next slide, I just did a bit of that too. It's you know twelve. You know you can just see see what's going on here. So pretty significant uh, in seriously delinquent loans. Um, in in different locations, and it pretty much um, you know it pretty much mirrors um, you know the previous set of slide, which was just overall delinquency. There's gonna a few a few shifting here and there, but it's pretty much the same. So anyway, again, it, it's this is not surprising. You you see it. It's in to me. It's in um, regions. It's around big, it's bigger cities and different states. Um, various regions, the Northeast, the South, Texas areas, um, you know, certain locations here and there, you know, larger cities, etc. So it just seems to make sense. But this is serious delinquency. So obviously these are, you know, they they will increase at a, at a you know, it's a, it's a drag along pace after the total delinquencies as well too. Each month that goes by, more move into serious delinquency category, simple as that. Now I just pulled this as well too. Um, they actually had a in foreclosure count. So you can see this is a little different. So, um, you know, the the total amount of, you know, FHA loans in foreclosure right now, led by, you know, Chicago, Baltimore, New York City area, Cleveland, Nassau County, Washington, St. Louis, Philadelphia, Houston, Cincinnati, um, Indianapolis, Camden, Pittsburgh, Columbus, Tampa area, Albany area, Hartford area, Newark, Tulsa, New Haven, Oklahoma City, Syracuse, Atlanta, Rochester, Albuquerque, Buffalo area, Dayton area, Louisville, Kentucky, uh, Wilmington, Orlando area, Las Vegas area. So now this, this is the foreclosure count. And, and so these are our are, are properties that had already, I guess you said, have already gone through the delinquency status into serious delinquency and now are actually into what I would call the official, their official foreclosure. Like they are in the foreclosure process. They've received either notice of default or our list pendants, the um, notice of litigation from their lender, depending on the state that the city, the locations reside in, it could be a trustee type state or a judicial state. That'll depend on how the foreclosure law is implemented and processed here. But the point is, you know, there's, you can see that, you know, certain locations now are, are going to change. Uh, and it depends on what goes on locally uh, and how they're processing the stuff. But because these are FHA based loans, um, this is the, the other, you know, Miami, Detroit up there, Providence, Gary, Jacksonville. So we're seeing it kind of, kind of play out here. So there, when I'm looking at these counts, like there's not a lot of these counts. Like if I look, okay, well, if 110, um, there's 110 
foreclosures in Miami Beach right now, um, that area. But I know that, in, and again, I know that in Dade County, there's like, you know, probably, you know, the, what we show on, you know, 6,000 or something like that minimum. Okay. That includes other parts of Miami as well, too. Uh, but the point is that FHA foreclosure counts. There's no additional processing. So remember when we had the moratorium that came in from FHA, which is still in place and is extended already for one or two more months to, into the new year, um, they're not actually foreclosing upon people. So those are people that are like in limbo. They're in like, I guess, suspended animation with their with their um, you know, their foreclosure process right now, which is clearly benefiting them, which is great. Uh, but once, you know, so because the FHA has the for, foreclosure eviction and sale moratorium, they're also not processing new foreclosures. So really, um, once the moratoriums expire, suddenly all these FHA loans, so a lot of these delinquent loans as we're looking at stacking up, a lot of them are going to fall into the foreclosure processing you know, category and these counts are going to go up. So just the way it kind of works. So again, I just wanted to show you that um, you know we're we're not seeing any decreases. We're seeing increases, and um, I know that typically this time of year, um, over the holidays, the, the over the you know winter holidays, there's not much going on with respect to um, lawyers or, or, or legal firms. You know, uh, law firms. You know, pushing or, or putting in new cases uh, for foreclosures, and they're not really doing a heck of a lot respect to taking them to foreclosure sale once the new year starts everything picks up again so that's why you know i'm gonna i'm sure we're gonna see some more overall statistics increase but the fha stuff's gonna remain at least the foreclosure counts remain static until any sort of moratorium is changed or lifted so please keep that in mind because when you look at this you go oh, only only 86 you know and this is just fha loan this is not fanny freddie this is not uh you know va this is not um Conventional loans, portfolio loans, non-bank loans, stuff like that. So again, this is just a you know one sixth of, of the overall segment of loans that are out there. But you can see that this can quickly grow because it's being choked right now. So nothing is moving forward. You know, for these these delinquencies are just going to you know continue to, to become seriously delinquent until you know they either solve their problem or the you know the foreclosure moratorium is lifted and everything starts to process again. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, you know, why is this, you know, why do I always talk about this? Because, well, again, two housing narratives in play here, the K-shaped housing market. As I said, very the housing market stalled, very little inventory is left, and nothing's moving because a lot of the stuff that would normally be hitting the market or coming on the market or adding additional, you know, homes is just, it's not there. It's just, it's literally being controlled and, and stalled for us. Um, as I always mention, there are properties available right now. You just have to look. Um, and where in the distressed sales, this is a little, um, you know, screenshot of the National Association of Realtors, you know, annual, certain not annual, um, monthly national existing home sale report. Every month we take a look at this and I talk about it and distressed sales are only 1% of the overall transactions across the board, which is not much at all. And ultimately what that boils down to is that there's only 1%, which are what, what are they? We'll go to the next slide here. Distressed sales are bank owned, which are referred, so they've been foreclosed on, they are real estate owned or they're short sales. So in theory, half of them, half of the 1%, so half a percent is bank owned and half a percent is short sales. Not very much in distressed sales are not making an, uh, an impact. What is the starting point for distressed sales? Well, we just talked about it, mortgage delinquency. So people who are not paying their mortgage are following the mortgage delinquencies and, and, and they're going down that path. People in forbearance, they've got a pause on forbearance, but here's the problem. Once the forbearance ends, and I heard this today from somebody else. Again, I, I, you know, I, I have people I listen to and, and read, um, not other people like me on this channel, like other different people. Okay, so I heard an interesting comment this morning about, you know, when forbearance is over, you technically have to requalify to start your mortgage up. And it's like exactly right. You have to prove that you can now prove the option, the ability to repay. And if not, then you're going to fall into the foreclosure side of the house. So, you know, mortgage delinquencies leads to forbearance. If you if you elect for it out of forbearance, if, if you if you can work it, that's great. If not, it's going to lead to more foreclosure filings or notice of defaults, which will lead, obviously, to foreclosure auctions. And where do we go from there? Well, guess what? Um, this is the end point for distressed sales. Why? Because at a foreclosure auction, third-party bidder, so you and I can 
can can bid and and purchase a property at the you know the county or this is the mortgage foreclosure auction. If nobody buys, it's taken back by the bank lender. They take it back you know at the foreclosure auction and it converts to a, a real estate owned REO. Now whether that comes back into the marketplace or not, it's, it's to be determined. Homeowner gets evicted, the tenant gets evicted, it's not a good thing. And they also have ongoing financial issues with the foreclosure. Um, the other end point for distressed sales is a deed in lieu of foreclosure, which means I can voluntarily give the home back to the bank and walk away a little cleaner. Maybe get something that's called cash for keys, but it's still a foreclosure. It still negatively affects your, your credit and, and it's still a foreclosure on your credit. So you have to be aware of that. Or you can do a short sale settlement, which typically is uh, in 99% of the time, it's the better or best solution for a home homeowner to package their debt, uh, get a settlement, get a waiver of deficiency, which means the lender's not going to pursue you for that difference and life will be good. All right. Better than it was before. and You'll be out of the mess. So that's the opportunity here. So listen, I just analyzed uh, the last three months of foreclosure auctions, at least locally down here. I saw some very interesting trends and I'll be, I will be incorporating a lot of this as I go forward with myself and my clients. So the whole point is you're going to say, well, how, what is that? Well, I'm not going to tell you about it here because that's what I call, you know, my intel that I work, you know, long hours for, you know, literally with an adding machine and going, you know, property by property, looking at websites, trying to get this information. So um, if you want to know what I'm talking about and how you can participate in this market, just connect with me. There's my email there and we can go from there. All right, guys, uh, listen, have a good holiday season. Um, probably do some more um, videos this week. I'm available this week. So if you've reached out to me before, connect with me again. Let's get going on this type of stuff for the new year. Um, if you've sent me an email, I haven't responded to you. Today I already sent off a slew of response emails. So let's make sure we connect this week and we'll talk about your real estate needs. All right. All right, guys. Take care. Talk to you soon.